Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Friday episode of Stand Up. Today, I will be joined by the brilliant Celeste Headley because at the beginning of the week, I put out on Discord for paid subscribers who have access to it. Who would you like to hear this week? And several of you said Celeste Headley. So guess what? I reached out to Celeste. She was available. We sat down and had another amazing conversation, and I'm going to get right to it because I don't have time to do the news before the hangout. Everything ran into each other today. All good. I may go back and do a new segment for you and repost the show. But right now, I'll get right to my conversation with Celeste Headley, who's one of the best journalists in the country. Primarily, Celeste has spent her career as a radio journalist on NPR and PBS and Georgia Public Broadcasting. She has hosted so many different shows over her careers, but she's also written four very important books, which I've talked to her about all of them. Do Nothing, which is her bestseller, We Need to Talk, Speaking of race and herd mentality back in 2016, she's an expert on so, so many things. She's a brilliant communicator. I always love talking to her. She's a journalist, an author, a speaker, a musician, so talented, so smart, so great. Find out more about Celeste in the show notes on today's show. Follow her and support her on social media like Instagram and Twitter and listen to everything. Read everything she's writing. Get her books. But let's do it right now with Celeste Headley. I wanted to get this up and recorded before I got a little intoxicated uh, at the hangout tonight. So hopefully you appreciate it and are okay with me skipping the news. I may come back and repost it with the news. Sorry I didn't get to it specifically to Ryan G, who begs for it on Fridays as well as the rest of the week. But it's been a great week of shows and guests, and I am not done. Let's do it right now with the great Celeste Headley. She's super busy in high demand, so we're very grateful anytime you can join us here on Stand Up. Celeste, welcome back. The people, they asked for you. So good to be here. I would like to meet these people and ask about their well-being. But yes, it's good to be back. <laughs> Thank you. I think you just did. Say hi, Tina. Uh, <laughs> Tina, I think, was specifically, and then other people were like, yes, where has Celeste been? And so I'm really uh, excited to see you. There's so much to talk with you about. First, though, I wanted to discuss, you, you're, you've you been a very respected journalist your entire career. You're a journalist. You do the work. I think most people would agree on that if they know even a little bit about you. How do you think we are doing right now covering this campaign. You've written a whole guide about what we're supposed to be doing. The political media, two thumbs down. Yeah, oh. it's pretty bad. So I entered my research into this and I spent months researching this because I had done like last year, a deep dive into dog whistles and how journalists end up repeating and amplifying dog whistles. And over the course of that, I started to realize how Few of our journalistic decisions are actually based on evidence. It's mostly based on what we call news instinct, <laughs> which is the same mm. as gut instinct, which means it's based on nothing. It's based on our emotions, our unconscious biases. So I decided to just interrogate how do we cover politics and how much of it is actually backed up by evidence. And by that, how much of it is proven by the evidence to actually improve the discourse, inform our listeners or readers or whatever, and do all of that without damaging democracy. Hmm. And turns out very little of what we do satisfies all three of those. So it was a revelation to me. I ended up writing a full, like a long guide over 50 pages. But people, if they want it, they can download it at headwaytraining.org. But, and I, I've started doing workshops because we really don't, there's so much research out there, Pete academics and scholars have been actually looking into this and asking these questions. Does horse race journalism, you know, do damage? And they have been getting the evidence for these things and we've been ignoring it completely. So yeah, two thumbs down. Yeah. In terms of if the question is what is journalism, what is responsible journalism and covering a political campaign, a presidential campaign, politics in general, the goal being to preserve democracy. I think of that's, I think that's what I heard, but the issue, I feel like all that research points to the best, most credible way to inform people. But as we both know, it may not sell as well. And so you're not conditioned to do it. Why would I do something that no one's going to care as much about, even though it's the right thing to do, as opposed to pick a team, trash people, be loud, do the things that'll get a million clicks and a million dollars. Am I, is that a fair question? Yeah, it's a fair question. It's just the wrong question. 
it's a wrong question because those clicks are not the same as listeners or readers liking it. Right. Like right now we're doing coverage that is intended and designed either consciously or unconsciously to um, spark people's fear and anxiety Mm -hmm. or their outrage. And that will get them to click on it. But study after study after survey shows that the audience hates it. In fact, they tend to view people who uh, outlets who do a lot of horse race journalism as really low quality. And that's true of NPR as it is of the Wall Street Journal. As soon as you start digging into those things that like horse race journalism, a lot of polls, a lot of strategists coming on saying this is how this is playing among the voters, that kind of crap. Listeners view it as bad journalism and low quality. They don't enjoy it. Why is it bad? Why is it bad to talk about what? young people think, what black and brown people think, what women think, how this is playing, how the Middle East, why is that bad? So you're talking about a couple different things. How something is playing is horse race journalism. That's where you're digging into the strategy of how someone is going to get elected. You're treating it like a game. How, who's winning (laughs) and how many, how, what are their sales? That's essentially what you're doing. You're like an off, you're like deciding how good a book is based on how many copies it's sold. As opposed to asking people what they care about is totally valid. Look, the research on this is almost unanimous in in denouncing covering politics as a competition. It damages society. It damages journalism as an industry. It increases by double digits distrust of journalism. And it's really unhelpful for reporters. We don't ask is this proposal good? In other words, what evidence do we have that this particular proposal will work or will not work? We ask, can it pass? Is it popular? So we're not actually giving information to voters, not useful information. How useful is it to someone on whether or not a a particular proposal is popular or not? It's not useful. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that. I've always tried to cover policy as much as I can. I'm sure you've heard. I'm just thinking like the last person. I'm sure you've heard of this book that just came out by Jessica Calarco, How Women Became America's yeah. Safety Net. And it's like a deep dive on the problem and policies and diagnoses of it. And I think that you do these interviews all the time. You talk to all these people. You are one of these people doing the work, doing the research. And I, I do. Obviously, there's an audience for policy for talking about problems and offering solutions and proposals, as you said, but is it enough of an audience or could we be doing it better? Yeah, there's enough of an audience. You have to remember that horse race coverage has really only dominated our political coverage for a pretty short period of time. And is it working? No, because every time you survey voters to see how well informed they are on particular right. issues or even on particular candidates, they are woefully uninformed. Right. I remember in 2020, Biden gave a, ma- a really significant speech about climate change. And there was a tweet from a WAPO reporter who said, after this long speech, the reporters present were allowed to ask three questions. And the question were, questions were, what's your message in Florida tomorrow? Why are your numbers among Hispanics so low? And are the gloves off, Mr. President? That's a great, that's a great question. That last one, are the gloves off, <laughs> Mr. President? And so, give me a break. The point means no questions about climate. None. Zero. And there were so many things. If you had a climate scientist there, they would have had a lot of effing questions. Well, is that the same as, You have a a bilateral meeting with another world leader sitting there and it doesn't matter what the president is. It's been this way as long as I can remember the coverage, Obama, Bush before him. They're sitting there. They're talking about the relationship with Ireland or even China or Israel or something. There's the Israeli prime uh, prime minister and the, the, the fires crackling. And then the questions are about some domestic scandal or gossip or Hunter Biden or something like that, as opposed to the conversation that they're like. What should the journalist be shouting out when the president's agenda is, in this case, foreign relations or in your case, climate or Obama talking health policy at in the East Room in a primetime conference? And all they asked about the next day was the skip gates and the cop because he called him a jackass. And the one question I try to ask myself is my question is the answer to my question going to help this voter as they go into the voting booth? Right. Or not. 
Another thing is that the, another suggestion, and I think it's a really great one. And this comes from John Alsop, who writes for the Columbia Journalism Review. He says that reporters need to be looking through a historical sense, right? To occasionally step out of the present moment yeah. and ask it, how, what would historians make of this coverage? <laughs> You just back on it. actually made the best argument for your point because I'm sitting here saying, does it make money and so on? And we both know, I'm sure you know, whether you like it or not, Heather Cox Richardson is doing exactly what that person suggested, using history as a guide to follow the present. So is Ruth Ben-Ghiat, Ken C. Davis and others. But she, Kevin Heather Cruz, Cox Richardson, yeah. is one of the most popular people on Substack, making millions and millions of dollars simply, not simply, but writing this historical, through this historical lens, and people eat it right up. And it's exactly what you're prescribing. So I feel yeah, like they voluntarily subscribe. She's got well over a million subscribers. So yes, people are hungry for this. They want to know the truth. And we're, look, I can't say it enough. Journalism is the only industry that is specifically protected by the Constitution. It is crucial to the health of our democracy. And at this moment in our country where we're worried about whether a representative democracy currently exists, it doesn't, or that we can keep it alive going into the future, that's a real question. But it's not rhetorical. Right. And the stakes on having good questions, good journalists asking good questions are, are just through the roof. When you hear CNN has done a poll or New York Times and Somebody else, they do them jointly. I guess they're expensive. They pay for them. Often, gets- yeah. When you hear about the polls, whether it be six months, three months, or three weeks before election day, what do you hear, Celeste, when you hear people talking about polls in their new segment? It's a couple things. First of all, opinion or, or viable or are they not at all? They're okay, but opinion polls aren't news stories. We don't even know if they, and number one, we know they're not accurate, it, written broadly, especially more than a month out from an election, they're really not accurate. Any- but also, considering the influence that they have on public policy and on voting behavior, i.e. whether or not someone actually votes, there's a question about whether reporting on uh, polls is, is ethically justifiable. I get that they're going to be used, but they should never be the news story. There's a new poll out. Let's do an interview with so-and-so. That's not the basis for a news story. And most another uh, there's a whole bunch of research studies that show journalists constantly make mistake. Even people like me, even really well-known trained journalists screw it up when they're reporting on polls. For example, let's say that there's a poll that shows a candidate is up by three points. Right. Maybe there's a three point margin of error. Right. So for that candidate to be leading in the race, you'd have to be ahead not by three points. You have to be ahead by six. But that's not how it's reported. They show they're ahead three points and maybe they mention there's a three point margin of error. They usually don't. But if they're not up by six, they're not leading. So well distilled. We love when we get a chance to listen to Celeste. I always tell you this, but it's always so much fun when I was already a fan of yours, already knew you had interviewed you. And there I was driving my car on West End Avenue and I heard this interview and I was like, oh my God, this person is so good. Who is this? And then I found out it was you and I was like, oh, I don't know. I didn't recognize it, but of course it's her. And I'm being reminded of how great you are and and, and how much I love talking to you. Let me ask you though, another just quick question about politics. I'm sure or maybe you didn't see Ken Burns, his uh, commencement speech the other day at Brandeis. Yes, I didn't watch the whole thing. I only saw excerpts. How dare you? Why do you hate America? <laughs> well, the gist of it was that him, I'm sure you know him personally, yes. but you know him and he's tried to stay apolitical in his work, his documentaries about everything from the Civil War to baseball to Vietnam. And he's always tried to not make over political statements in case anybody doesn't know that. So basically in the speech, he came out and said there is no choice in this election. What do you think of his reaction? What do you think of just journalism in general and how it should be covered when the choice is between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, two people who we know very well? Yes. So Ken Burns is under everything a historian. That's what he is, right? He's dedicated his life to telling history. And Ken Burns remarks were not at all outside the norm for what we're hearing from 
professional historians. You just mentioned Heather Cox Richardson. She's saying basically the same thing. Kevin Cruz, same thing. So many historians are saying the same thing that like, look, democracies is a choice. <laughs> it's a choice we have to make. And in this particular case, democracy is on the ballot. There's, this isn't even a question. This isn't even a matter of whether I'm being biased or not. First of all, I'm an independent. I'm not a Democrat. But second of all, we literally have Trump's own words on what he would do while in a second term, and they are anti-democratic and autocratic. So that's not even bias. That's just what, literally us believing what he says about a second term for him. Do I think that Ken Burns is being biased? <laughs> I think this is a professional expert reading history and saying, uh, if you care about democracy, there you, there isn't really a choice. One candidate, whether he's weak or problematic or flawed, which Biden is all of those things, one candidate will is, is saying they will uphold democracy. One is saying that he will not. I, I just, don't you think? <laughs> don't you think it's bad to ask a person in an interview questions starting with "Don't you think"? <laughs> I realized what I, I was doing. So I, do. <laughs> I feel like one of the issues is we don't understand. We're so ignorant and apathetic about history at this point in time. Young folks, it's easy to say. Old folks, it's been if they ever even knew it. People don't understand what a country without a democracy like whatever we have left is. You could look around now or you could look in the history more accurately. It's interesting talking to you on D-Day and, and talking about World War II history, which is not very far, but it seems like people have forgotten that. They've forgotten or don't even acknowledge the Holocaust happened and how to a certain extent. So much of history is either lost or never learned. And that seems to be the crux of the problem as to why people don't understand how sacred democracy is my opinion. What do you think about that is the way I put it. I totally agree with it. And let's not forget that we are also coming away from the anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. So when we talk about history, what we know about history is very much influenced by who's telling it. And so Juneteenth, if you want and Juneteenth coming up. Absolutely. So and we also know that speaking of Juneteenth, one of the reasons this is celebrated was that some enslaved people weren't even freed by the time Juneteenth came around. Why? Because they were in rural areas and they had no idea that the North had won the war and they were free. A, history is in the eye of the beholder and it, we are all better off when we rely on people who actually do the frickin' research and are bringing you, searching for those voices that have been si silenced by the powerful in the past. Second, do we appreciate our democracy? Of course we don't. I mentioned earlier we don't have a representative democracy. That, again, is not biased. That's not my opinion. That's true. If you look up the definition of representative democracy, we don't have that right now. No, there are think tanks and institutions, academic institutions that measure democracy from country yep. to country and in within your own country throughout time and so on. So, yeah, look, the U.S. is a very young country in the history of the world. We're not Greece, right? Like we're a young country. We could lose it. <laughs> we could lose it very easily. and. People don't understand what that means. How go to travel, go to a country where yeah. democracy is not strong or doesn't First exist. All, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> the ball. That's fair. That's absolutely fair. Don't you think, though, like we could lose it. We have lost so much in the past few years since the Supreme Court in 2010 gutted the Voting Rights Act. Within our lifetime or close to it, we saw rights won and lost within our lifetime or the past two generations. It feels like you're, we're watching voting rights and I'll just say reproductive rights, most prominently those two being taken during our lifetime. Yeah, but you and I both, you like history too. And so we, the book that I'm researching right now to, um, that I'm writing right now is based in reconstruction and, and the early 20th century. All throughout American history, you will see an expansion of rights followed by a, an even more aggressive and muscular clamping down on rights, usually for a certain segment of the public, whether it's women or people of color, et cetera. We didn't, after reconstruction, which was this fantastic 
incredible. It's almost like the enlightenment, frankly, for the United States. The the people who loved the lost cause myth for the South tried to make it look like Reconstruction was a failure. It wasn't. It was incredible. But it was followed by Jim Crow. It was followed by a, a com- violence and the KKK and birth of a nation. And we didn't imagine the fight, the decades of fighting that had to get claw back some of those freedoms that brought us the Voting Rights Act and all of those things that are now being eroded. This tug of war will continue. It will always continue. And it just goes back to your earlier question about do we take it for granted they always have to be protected, these rights. That's why they're civil rights. They're not natural rights. Right. They are civil. Human rights and civil rights. Yeah. Yeah. So well said. You said you have to imagine. Not if you pay close attention to history. Not if you've gone to a museum or watched a documentary or got a book. Like, stay. That's why it is so important. It's why I've interviewed historians the entire time I've been doing the show. Because yeah. it's, it's always so relevant and so uh, apparent. Okay, let me talk a little bit about, I hate to shift off that general subject, but let me talk a little bit about some of the work you're doing now, which is like DEI training. You are such a brilliant person in all these different ways that we've talked about established. You wrote a book about how to have conversations better. You wrote a book about doing nothing. And you wrote a book about talking about race, speaking of race, why everyone needs to talk about race and how to do it. Real quick, before I get to the harder subject, is your book, do nothing. The one that sold the most copies of anything. Oh yeah. It keeps going back and becoming a bestseller. I'll have weeks where it sells thousands of copies and it was published in 2020. Yeah. It's, it just keeps. I I, I read that in prepping and I, I'm very happy to hear that. I hope that it pays for the rest of your life, but (laughs) I just real quick, just about that. Why is that the, do you think the most, the best selling or the most popular thing that you've done when you've done everything you've talked about everything that's important in the world and the book do nothing is somehow the one that's sold the most. I just think that people are at the breaking point with their lives and this overwork and burnout. I just think people are at the point where they're like, something has to give. And in many cases it it is their own health, but I, I would hope they read either my book or somebody else's that has real research behind it. That doesn't just give them Instagram advice, right? Go sit on a beach. Um, I just, I would <laughs> love to hear you just shit on all of these influencers when you did all the work that much of which they stole and in an academic and scholarly way. And they're just like, let me look as pretty as I can and, and make everybody's life better on TikTok and Instagram. I'm going to take video of my perfectly manicured feet, pedicured feet at the beach and, and, um, tell everyone to stop working. I, I'm not trying to shit on anybody. I guess I am. I am. Um, (laughs) You know, by the way, I, (laughs) yeah, I just think that people are really so brittle. They're, they will break. And that book is the anti self-improvement book. That's the book that where it's, you're fine. It's not you. It's the system. And I can't fix the system for you. We are going to all have to do that together, but here's a few things that can help. That's great. That's a great yeah. way of talking about it. And we should do I would do a whole nother talk about it. I think we all need to read it over and over. I went on, I took some time off for the first time in a long time and I had no idea how to behave. <laughs> Knowing you, that does not surprise me in the least. Yeah, not good. Okay. So <laughs> let's talk about DEI. Oh my God. Gosh, has this been demagogued and demonized and over just it, there's so many things to talk about. But you've seen the history of this unfurl and your career. I was going to say our lives, but in your career, DEI, why it's important, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the corporate world in nonprofits and academia in lower school and so on. It wasn't so controversial for a long time. It felt I like. can make it not controversial now if you're we're going to make. Yeah, if we're going to make DEI a political football, fine. We don't have to say DEI. Let's just say belonging. Every single, almost everyone has been to elementary school and you know exactly how much it hurts when you get excluded by some click or they start choose some name for you and some bully chooses a name for you and then everyone starts calling you poopy pants or whatever it may be. I was Everybody, big, head, big head, little body stuck. I was sublast. I don't know. 
Well, that's I, actually cool. I, I, it sounds like a, an independent I, band that rocks. But okay. when you're a little girl who's trying to be all feminine, <laughs> Sublast is not feminine. But we all know what that feels like to be excluded and excluded on purpose. That's all that inclusion means. It means regardless of who you are, you belong here. We're not going to shit on you. And we're not going to call you names. When people are asking you to use their own pronouns, that's all they're doing. They're saying, stop calling me names. You don't, you're as a bully. Don't pick what to call me. Let me tell you what to call me. That's if I got married and I chose to change my name and you're just like, no, I'm going to use your maiden name because I don't believe in changing your names. Come on. <laughs> you don't get to, that's just bad behavior. So I can make this all non-political because it's not political. This is about not being shitty to other human beings because we know what it feels like when others are shitty to us. That's all it means. It means microaggression. We can use the word microaggression, or you can just say, look, if you walk in across a room and you step on someone's toe and they say, ow, you say, sorry. That's it. Does that cover all the D, E, and the I? Yeah, because diversity just means we're different. So if you go to a new school and you're the new kid and you get picked on, that's just diversity. Equity just means, look, <laughs> we're not going to play favorites. You ever had a teacher who played favorites? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Or maybe a parent that has a favorite kid. We know what it's like when someone's playing favorites and we're not it. That's all equity is. It means, look, I don't care if you like me. Just don't make it harder for me. Life's hard enough. And this is the thing for me. It's we all know how hard life is. We know what a struggle it is. I finally got to the place in my house where I'd finally repaired everything that the home inspector in 2019 told me needed to repair. And I was like, oh, and my oven broke. <laughs> That's like a four, $3,500, $4,000 replacement. And I'm just like, we know life is a fucking struggle. So why are we trying to make it harder for other people? Why are we saying life is so hard for me? I'm going to make it hard for you too. It's already hard for them. It's hard for everybody. But look, also this is that's all a, DEI is. Also explains why there's a bonfire on behind Celeste. Very well explained. But don't you think, aren't we on some kind of a spectrum of empathy? Part of me makes, I, I look at certain folks in America right now, and I think they actually take joy in, in my suffering. They don't know how to feel for other people's not belonging. They actually actively want to hurt. Cruelty is the point. What about that? Yeah. Yes. Empathy yeah. is not a set level, right? You're not born with a high level of empathy and then that's it for the rest of your life. It can increase, it can decrease. So yes, you are correct. Writ large across the United States, empathy has been on the decline for decades. And empathy isn't even the gold standard. Empathy is the first step to what really matters, which is compassion is empathy in action. Empathy is identifying of somebody else's feelings. I can accurately see that person is suffering. I recognize that they are suffering. Compassion is I see them suffering and I would like to help. Doesn't mean you do help. If you're feeling compassion, it means you want to. Right. And without compassion, what's the point of empathy? It's just that empathy is the first step. And most of us don't, many of us can't seem to even make that first step. What's it called when a friend of mine does this, sees someone in pain and looks away and runs? I would never do that. My friend did that. I've done that. When my friend, <laughs> that's when that my it's friend, called yeah, awful. I've done it. It's sometimes it's so hard to watch people you care about be in, in pain. And I just remember specifically a friend who was getting divorced and I like just, I just ran. I, he told me all about it and I just didn't call. I've been trying to make up to, to him and so many other people for that for a long time. But we do that. That's another part of, running from what's difficult. I got my own problems. I can't help you with yours. Which is sometimes true. It's sometimes the case. Empathy is a costly. Yes. And I we love, don't always have the capacity. I love what you said, though. Compassion is empathy in action. Wrote it down. So let's talk about specifics. You're now posting videos at Twitter, which I'm really happy to see that you're still on and using because everything sucks. So we have to use whatever yeah. we can. That's the way I see it. I don't know if you see it differently, but it's not like a social media platform that I'd be like, no, I'm going to this one. It's so much more ethical as who was it yesterday? Jeff Charlotte, I think said, everything's owned by billionaires. Like you just, you got to get, everything. anyway, did you have 
the part of this DEI training things that you're offering now, did you get consent for this conversation? That's a video you posted. People should go watch it, but give me and follow you on Instagram and Twitter, of course, links in the show notes. But tell me uh, why you're thinking about this and posting this. What is consent for a conversation? Now I have to get consent for a conversation, Celeste? Yeah, you do. And this is specifically referring to a deeper conversation about personal identity. Yeah, you got to ask if it's okay. But this also comes up in meetings all the time. And this is one of the things that sparked the video is because when you're in a meeting or this happened recently where we were attending a, a book talk over Zoom and they opened it up to questions and comments and somebody started going off on their own personal experience, their family's medical history and blah, blah. And we're all just sitting there going, just kill me, just <laughs> get it over with. That's somebody who is abusing consent. Because if you're in a group setting, it's impossible to get consent. And I say that because in a group setting, it's not considered appropriate to tell someone to shut up. And so therefore, you can't even ask, can I tell you this this story about my prostate? Because everyone's going to go, oh, yeah, sure, of course. You oh, yeah. can't. Yeah. You don't have consent if you're in a group setting. You have to follow the norms of the group in a work meeting, in a Zoom call, period. But in a conversation like about identity, and the example that I gave in the video is, let's say that you are a white person and, and you ask to touch a black person's hair. That's usually accompanied by you're already reaching for it, right? You can interrupt. It can be interrupted. <laughs> like the person of color can say, absolutely not. That's inappropriate. I hope that you didn't mean that in a racist way, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, but no. That's okay. The, no consent required. The, they did something, reached out towards you, and you responded. What's What you need consent for is either the person of color wants to explain how bad it was or talk about how this person is always terrible, or the white person wants to understand and get more details on why it was bad. You need to ask. Not everybody's ready for that conversation. And if they're not ready for it, you walk away. So important. I'm going to apply that to our hangouts because we've had those kind of things. I try so hard to create a safe space for people to talk about whatever's going on. But yeah, sometimes that kind of thing happens and it's important before we talk about something to, to get that permission while we're in this group setting. I never thought about that. You're the smartest. All right. Let me ask you. Well, specifically, there's a longtime listener. She brings it up and hits me over the head with it every time possible. One time we were together happened to be a woman of color named Karen. Everybody knows Karen. And I was eating with her and several other people. And I reached onto her plate and I took some of her, I moved some of her food to get to some better food. And then I took it off of her plate and she brings it up almost anytime my name is mentioned. I did not get consent to reach onto that poor woman's plate. Yeah. And she, you, I would imagine agree with her and all other humans. Apparently that is somewhere where it's not, as important as the example you're giving, but yet still, if you don't want to get a fork in the top of your hand. It's important. Stereotypically, women are terrible about this and will often say, no, I don't want fries. And then they'll take a fry off their boyfriend, oh. partner's friend's huh. plate. That's the stereotype. And frankly, I found that to be true. I have to stop myself oh. from doing that. Does she? Does Karen, do you have to keep bringing it up? She does. It's, does she? It gets, yes, it gets worse every time the scenario. Oh, I'm, each time uh, she describes it. Every time she describes it, first of all, it gets big laughs, but I have become more and more of a monster. Yeah, you're Torquemada now. I gripped and handled every chicken wing before I got to the one I wanted. You licked it. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 on my beard and then put them back. Yes. She scratched your pelvis with it. I yeah. Did. And then now that I did, but it was, I ate that one. Okay. <laughs> so let's get serious. How dare you, Celeste? Very important last issue I wanted to talk with you about, about how you are thinking about covering, discussing what has happened in the Middle East now, much less ever, since October 7th since the retaliation and the slaughter and everything we've seen since it's it really become so divisive in America on campuses and obviously in this presidential campaign, you're Jewish, you're black, the divide there. Then there's the rest of us. I have no idea. I've been so confused on how to talk about it. I've been covering it my whole life. And now I feel torn. I don't know. I don't even think I should be talking about it half the time. How are you thinking about it being a journalist and being who you are? We should be talking about it. We should admit what we don't know. And reading a couple articles on Israel and Palestine does not mean, but I will, I am anti-human suffering. P 
period. I am anti the terrorist attack on Israel. I am anti all of the attacks on the Palestinian civilians that have followed. I don't think you prove that you have suffered by forcing other people to suffer. I can't say that enough. I would also say <coughs> that if any of your sentences begin, not you particularly, but if any of a person's sentences begin with, why can't Jews just, or the Jews should stop right there. What you're about to say is anti That's actually how I open most shows. <laughs> I, I totally see that. Yeah. Either that or I heard this Nazi saying, now bear with me. <laughs> I like, I'm very fond of saying I'm not racist and citing my black roommate from college. Roommates, too. <laughs> Be a nice human. That's the t-shirt. Yeah, that's my t-shirt. If you are making yourself okay with the murder of children because of politics, you have been subject to propaganda. <clears throat> there is no situation in which the murder of your own family members would be okay politically if it was your own family. You know, the situation between Israel and Palestine is complicated. Israel is at in peril all the time. And if they were not defended, many of the Arab countries that surround them would immediately take advantage of that. There's no question. But you don't... Um, They've tried several times. Yes, and continue to. We don't even hear about the stray bombs that go over uh, because it's so routine. But that doesn't ever make it okay to murder people. You know, my grandparents, we lost a lot of family members in the Holocaust. My um, grand, my great grandparents fled the pogroms in Eastern Russia and in, in Eastern Europe. And that can, that kind of suffering can either make you aware of the frailty of the human condition and the need to help others no matter what, or it can send you into amygdala thinking. It can make view everyone through the, the veil of fear and threat, and it can make you sociopathic. I choose the Grinch uh, way yeah. of viewing things. It's going to make my heart bigger and bigger, not smaller. I love it. Given what we talked about at the beginning in terms of democracy and the stakes and the Ken Burns points and what you're saying now, what do you, Celeste, make of the argument that you're hearing from certainly a lot of Arab Americans, black Americans and progressives, Democrats in general. I cannot vote for genocidal Joe. I cannot support Joe Biden because for president, because he is whatever, however people see it, been uh, complicit in the slaughter of Palestinian kids. I can't support him because of that. I can't pull the lever for him. Been a very eloquent and passionate a commentary at one of our hangouts by a listener named Scott about this. And I hear it a lot. You hear it a lot. What do you make of that argument? Let me respond to Scott in particular. I make no comment on the strengths of the Biden administration's Israel policy. I have a lot of problems with it. It is more than flawed. We have to set that aside because the question that we face in November is not is we're not voting on this particular plan that's coming from the Biden administration or another particular plan, we're voting on two men. And the question is, OK, so you think the Biden administration's policy in Israel and Gaza is flawed. I agree with you. That means you're not going to vote for him because you think Trump's is better. Because that's the question. The question of. No, I just can't see myself pulling the lever for a man who is. That's been not the way voting works. It's not the way voting works. And look, if you want to see a group of people who are the most pragmatic, realistic, grounded voters on the planet, it is black women. They know every candidate is flawed. Every candidate. There is no hero worship of a candidate from black women. But every single time they will choose the lesser of two evils. Every time. It's not a principle. It's not philosophy. You're choosing between two individuals. And say what you will and not voting is your choice. That's you making a choice. That's not how voting works. And look, I know it's been said before and I'll say it again. There are, you know, people who whose lives are in jeopardy, whose lives, whose safety will be decreased under a Trump administration, not because of what I believe about Trump, because of literally what he has said, don't have the benefit of standing on principle 
and taking a risk that their that their choice not to vote means they did vote for the other guy. Very well said. I cannot argue with anything that Celeste just said. I guess finally, what I want to ask you about, if you have any thoughts on what's going on at the Supreme Court, we're into it. It's June. We're going to have some real tough days. There's no doubt about it. Uh, But what, if any, thoughts do you have on uh, this Supreme Court? Where we're at? Our Supreme Court is a remnant of, of a monarchy. There is absolutely no accountability for the Supreme Court. And that's not a democracy. If you get to get put, can be put into a position in which you have to answer to no one, in which your decisions override the will of the people, override their chosen elected representatives, and are never to be questioned, that's a monarchy. It has to be reformed. We cannot go forward. We relied in the past on the Supreme Court being honorable. <laughs> and, and that's a whole nother conversation, that whole honor conversation. And I purposely say that with some stank on it. Right. Um, it worked for a while, <laughs> but it's not working anymore. We can't rely on people's fear that their reputation will be damaged. So it, if if this is telling us anything, and it doesn't matter if you're conservative or, or liberal, maybe you are super conservative and you wish John Roberts wouldn't side with the Democrats sometimes. Fair. But no one can hold John Roberts accountable. Ever. Or question his ethics. And his word and the word of whomever is in the majority of the Supreme Court overrides everything. And even if it's not supposed to, as set up in our government constitutionally, the Supreme Court is now stepping out of their own boundaries and saying they get to decide on things that they were never meant to decide on. Is it do you think it's too far? I don't know if you saw this. This is recent reporting. Samuel Alito is now wearing a crown. Yeah. He's got a. he's now at the hearings. He wears a crown because he actually thinks he is a king. More of that. We're going to see more of that, I suppose. You could wear a jester's hat. Oh, better said. Yeah. Oh, he's rough. A fool. Yeah. I will let you go. I don't want to. There's I could talk to you about anything. You're the best. And I'm so glad that you joined me today. And I hope we can talk soon. On behalf of everybody, I thank you for your wisdom, your knowledge, your compassion. And (laughs) well, there you go. Celeste Headley. What a wonderful laugh to end it on. Thank you very much, Celeste. And for everybody supporting and listening to me and requesting her join me. Who else would you like to hear? Tell me in Discord. Tell me in email. Any feedback you have. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. And of course, subscribe on patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Give a rating and review on Spotify and iTunes to support John Carroll. JohnCarroll.org right now. He wrote this song. You should buy it. I will probably be posting something for Saturday. Hell, maybe even Sunday. I'm really hitting my groove. You guys are the best, and I will talk to you later, you bumblebees. Trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creaky knees, you got to stand up. Stand up. I think your driving wheels been leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep things right. We got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. We got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eye. We got to let him know it's his turn to go. See it clear when all you hear is a lie. Go get up off of your butt. Get down off of your fence. Even if it ain't a very friendly audience. Start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town. Just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the place where every lost child will finally be found. We stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a 